Well, welcome to the God, Beer, and People series. Thank you so much. I don't really have much of the introduction. I just really wanted to thank you guys that have been taking the time to watch these presentations. Um, I have I do this mostly for myself, um, just spending time in God's word and really reading his word and letting him speak to me. And so all glory to God. I just get to be his hands and his voice as I do what I'm called to do and what we're all called to do. And that is teach his word. So I hope this has been helpful and fruitful in your life. If it has, please like, please share. Um, and thank you. Enjoy this presentation of Haggai for only being two chapters long it is so rich with God's love and God's truth so thank you guys and again welcome to the God beer and people series with hops and hope we're taking a sharp turn here because if you're following each book that we've been doing we just finished the book of Ezra and we're jumping forward to the prophet section of the Bible today we're in the book of Haggai the book of Haggai Zechariah and Malachi are all books written post exile written to the exiles that have returned from Babylonian captivity so it's after exile which is why we are studying it today we're going to recap where we are today in the story. So Genesis chapters 1 through 11 display humanity's continual spiral back towards sin. Humanity fell miserably first with Adam and Eve's self-will and rebellion, which caused exile from the garden. But God hadn't given up on humanity. God provides a redemptive plan through the promised seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, the first hint of a coming redeemer. Now, this is such a significant verse. It says her seed. If you read the New King James Version or the King James Version, it specifically says her seed. It doesn't say the seed of a man. That prophesied not only the coming redeemer, Christ, but prophesied the virgin birth. Her seed. The text also explicitly says he will crush the serpent's head. So the use of he meaning one person, one redeemer coming. Now in the beginning, man had one God, but after exile from the garden, man came to worship the powers of nature, which seemed to be the sources of life, also sex because it was a means through which life came, and also kings because they had power. Nimrod was the world's first dictator who wanted to dominate God's creation. The Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 was the rebellious human race who didn't need God to rule over them. They could rule themselves and reach the heavens on their own terms with their own hands by their own means, and God intervened at Babel and they were exiled and dispersed. Now this is when God took a man from the heart of rebellion and made a new nation, a new people to reclaim and redeem mankind once again. The Abrahamic covenant occurs right after Genesis 11 in Genesis 12. Salvation will not only be for the physical children of Abraham, but for anyone who would believe. God's choice of Abraham begins the preparation of a nation through which the promised redeemer will come. So the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy recount the Israelites exiting Egypt and a covenant made between God and the nation of Israel. Now these laws govern their daily lives. Israel was to be holy. Blessings and curses are associated with the covenant and it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 28 rules based on relationship. Now the books of Joshua through Ruth recount the conquest and settlement in the promised land, the promised land of Canaan. First Samuel through Chronicles recounts the monarchy. It's the period when Israel was ruled by kings. Out of all nations, the Israelites were to be channels of God's grace to the nations, a kingdom of priests and a light to all nations. But like Adam, and humanity before them, their sins led to exile. 
they chose idolatry. What's interesting about the monarchy period is personal sins isn't what sent the nation into exile. It was their disloyalty to Yahweh. It was the breaking of the second commandment. That idolatry caused their exile. But there's hope in Second Samuel. God promises King David an eternal throne in the Davidic covenant. The Hebrew nation would bless all nations through the family of David, a great king who would one day be born into the family, a king who would live forever and establish a kingdom forever. The book of Ezra recounts their return from exile. They are back in the promised land awaiting the promised kingdom, the Messiah. So in Ezra chapter 5, it introduces the prophet Haggai, and that's where we are picking up today's story. Haggai is a short book two chapters long so we're covering it because we're introduced to Haggai in the book of Ezra chapter 5 and it should be studied with the book of Ezra so Haggai is a prophet meaning a spokesman for the Lord we'll read the expression thus says the Lord now the primary tasks of all the prophets was to call the Israelites back to faithfulness to their covenant and obedience to the terms of their covenant with God the background of Haggai begins in the book of Ezra chapter 4. The Samaritans heard that the exiles, the returned people from Babylon, were rebuilding the temple of the Lord. So the Samaritans were transplants. They're a mixed population and there's hostility between the Jewish people, the people who returned from exile, and the Samaritans. You can read about the Samaritans in 2 Kings chapter 17. So quick lesson on world history. A, B, P is the key to understanding the world empires of the Old Testament. A is the Assyrian Empire, B, Babylonian Empire, P, Persian Empire. So the Assyrian Empire was conquered by the Babylonians, and the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians. The Persians took control of Babylonia in about 539 BC. The Persians conquered most of the Middle East and part of Europe. No other people of the ancient world conquered as much land as the Persians. So they're the world empire at this time in the book of Haggai. These Samaritans set out to discourage the people of Judah by writing a letter to the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. These letters stopped the temple construction, claiming that the Jews had been troublemakers. So the Persian emperor, King Artaxerxes, issued a letter forcing the Jewish people to stop rebuilding the temple. Haggai chapter 1 verse 1 opens with in the second year of King Darius on the first day of the sixth month. So this was a gap of about 16 years from the time Artaxerxes issued a letter to stop to the next Persian king, King Darius. So Haggai speaks to Zerubbabel, who is the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the high priest. These are Israel's political leader and Israel's religious leader. So I'm going to start in verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. So they let the discouragement from the Samaritans stop them from rebuilding and concluded that it is not God's will to build the Lord's house. So they pussyfooted around focusing on their own personal affairs. They did build the altar of sacrifice that was built by Zerubbabel and Joshua. We went over that in the book of Ezra. The altar stood outside the temple, so they were able to offer sacrifices, but they hadn't built the temple. Ezra chapter 3 tells us the foundation of the temple was laid, but that's as far as they had gotten. So in one sense, they were obedient and correct to build the altar of sacrifice because that deals with sin and and atonement, it's worship without a building, which is okay. We don't need a church or a temple to worship God, though authentic worship is an important matter. However, the problem was that they stopped short when it came to doing God's will. They put their own priorities and comfort above God's will, and they used a lame excuse on why they stopped, claiming it was the timing. So it's not that they wouldn't do it, it was just bad timing. 
to do it. The verse reads, the time has not yet come. So it's a quick lesson here that we can worship and do these sacrifices, but is that of your own doing or what you're being called to do? Sometimes doing God's will is a little outside of our comfort zone and we can use lame excuses, masking it in spiritual ways. So Haggai calls them out. I'm going to read verses 3 through 4. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? I like how he says, is it a time to be living in comfort and luxury while God's house is in ruins? They're able to build their own houses, but God's house should have been built first. Remember, the temple is the dwelling place of God. The people had decided that rebuilding the Lord's dwelling among his people was not as important. So Haggai calls them out to reevaluate their priorities. I'm going to read verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Consider your ways. This is a key phrase in this book. We'll see it often. Consider your ways. I'm reading verses six through seven. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You're working hard, but not prospering. Your efforts are much, but you receive little. I think we can all identify with this. It's almost a good time to remember our history as idolaters. Um, remember Solomon? He tested all the pleasures in life, wine, women, works, wealth, wisdom, and he calls it all vanity. What really fills us is living a life pleasing to God. I'm going to read verse 8. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. God and his word must take first place in our life. I'm going to read verses 9 through 11. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with your own house therefore because of you the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops i called for a drought on the fields and the mountains on the grain the new wine the olive oil and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock and all the labors of your hands it's basically saying Putting personal interests ahead of God is self-defeating. God blesses those who put him first. In the New Testament, it's the same message, Matthew 6, verse 33. It tells us, but first and most importantly, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right. And he will give you everything you need. Our work is valued by how it conforms to God's will. So just like the message that we're getting here, consider your ways. The material blessings were withheld from the people and the solution was very simple. Go to the mountain, cut down trees, make lumber and build the temple. God would be glorified and pleased. Very simple solution. And in verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So a word of comfort and the people respond positively. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord. You have Zerubbabel, who is the political leader. He's the governor of Judah. And then you have Joshua, who is the high priest, a religious leader, and the whole remnant of people. I'm going to start in chapter two. It's about a month later. Haggai comes to the people and delivers a message of encouragement. Now read Reading the text, it appears that those who had seen the first temple, Solomon's temple, in all its glory, may be discouraged. They're looking at this new temple and it doesn't even compare to Solomon's temple. The former temple is glorious. 
This new temple is nothing in comparison. So I'm going to read verse 4. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I'm with you, declares the Lord Almighty. So it's be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua. Be strong, all you people of the land. Be strong and work. For I am with you. So God's presence is with them. We mustn't forget God is with us. Verse 5 is awesome. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is the same God who was with them when they came out of Egypt. This is the same God who helped Solomon build the glorious temple. It's the promise of God's presence, which is the heart of the covenant. Do not fear. The Lord is with you. Now I'm going to read verses 6 through 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. And the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place... I will grant my peace, declares the Lord. So the Lord promises to make the glory of this temple greater. Finding Jesus in the text, it's my favorite part in these presentations. So we know Zerubbabel is from the Davidic line. He is a civil leader. He is the governor of Judah. So he is a ruler. How is Jesus king? He is from the Davidic line. And there is no higher authority, no power, no king, no lord who can oppose him and win. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 21 through 22, I'll read the verse, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So Christ is not only the head of the church, but also the head over everything. As our Messiah, he continues to rule on the throne of King David. In this book of Haggai, Joshua is a high priest, a mediator between God and man. A high priest offers a yearly sacrifice for the atonement or payment of the people's sins, including his own. Jesus Christ was the perfect high priest. He did not have to offer sacrifices for his own sins. He was sinless, but he offered himself as an atonement or payment for our sins. So what makes Jesus our great high priest is that he is not only our mediator, but also our sacrifice. So the combination in this story, we have a ruler and high priest and all the people. That is us. That is the future glory of God's house. The combination of Jesus Christ and all the people, you and I, united in building the temple. Remember in Haggai chapter 2 verse 9, it says the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. God promises that the glory of this second temple that they're building is going to be greater than Solomon's temple. The future glory of God's house will not be made of stones, and that's what they're missing. It will be made of the souls of the redeemed. That's you. That's me. That's what he means when it says the future glory of God's house is going to be greater than what you're seeing. They're not understanding it at this time. What he's talking about is what we have in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says, don't you know? that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. In this book of Haggai, the people are looking at this temple made of stones and they're discouraged. What they're missing is that the temple isn't a building of stones. It will be a building of spiritual nature, living stones. Christian believers. As Christians, we are blessed to be the holy temple in the Lord. 
Our work is to build up the kingdom of God, win souls to Christ. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 through 21, I'll read it. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is grown into a holy temple in the Lord. Be strong and get to work. It's easy for us to neglect building God's house. We are like the people focused on personal affairs when we need to be building the kingdom of God. That is the future glory of God's house. We're still in chapter two. The Lord challenges the priests to think through two questions. The first question is in verse 12. It's, can holiness be transferred? And they answer no. The second question in verse 13, can the unclean make you unclean? The answer, yes. Anything touched by an unclean person becomes unclean. And I'm going to read verse 14. Then Haggai said, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer, there is defiled. The people are unclean and what they offer is unclean. Just because they're back in the Holy Land doesn't make them holy. They needed to obey the Lord by building his temple. It goes back to our earlier lesson. Just because we do the religious stuff doesn't make us holy. God knows and sees the internal, not the external. We need to obey the Lord and be set apart for his will. So verses 15 through 17. Now give careful thought. Before the stone was laid in the temple, things were scarce. Verse 18 through 19. Give careful thought. It's mentioned twice. Give careful thought. Consider what has occurred from the day the temple's foundation was laid. Is there any seed in the barn? No. Has the produce yielded its fruit? No. From this day on, I will bless you. So blessings might not come immediately, and he didn't want them to become discouraged, but to trust that from this day on, God would bless them. Verse 21 through 22, I'll read. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall each by the sword of his brother. So God will overthrow the kingdoms of the nations. Now this is important for the people to understand because those idols, those gods of the surrounding nations, led people away from Yahweh. But God rules all with the coming of Jesus, the restoration of the kingdom. There is so much more to this than the rebuilding of the temple. Their return would not be the kingdom of God. The kingdom will be a transformed society. That's why God says in verse verses 18 and 19, consider what has occurred from the day the temple's foundation was laid. Is there any seed in the barn? No. Has the produce yielded its fruit? No. Then something greater than the temple is coming. And I'm going to read verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. God says to Zerubbabel that the future glory of the temple will be understood one day. God is renewing his covenant with Judah. They have a future to look forward to. The text also mentions, I will make you like my signet ring. Now, a signet ring in ancient times was a form of identification. So instead of signing your name or their name, people would press their ring into hot wax or clay to make their mark. God is saying to Zerubbabel, who is from the chosen line of David, that God will make him like his signet ring. God will stamp or mark his ownership 
on earth. It was a, a stamp of authority. That's why we read in verse 22, I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of nations. So God's glory, majesty, and holiness will be made known to the nations. And that's the end of the book. Fortunately, you and I know what the future glory of God's house is, and that's what we'll unpack in the next slide. Your highlighted verse in the book of Haggai is in chapter 1, verse 4. So go back in your Bible, highlight this. I'll go ahead and read it if you recall. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? This is a call to question our priorities. In this story, Haggai called the people to build the temple and to keep their hope set on the coming Messiah and the establishment of his kingdom. That message remains the same for us. Do God's work. Build up his house till Christ returns. You know, our problem or humanity's problem is sin, separation from God, and they're facing spiritual death. We're all facing it unless you've been baptized in the name of Jesus. Humanity is headed for eternal separation from God without even knowing that Christ came to open a way back to God. And whose fault is it that they don't know? Every person has at least two things that provides the evidence for God. Number one, we all have creation. When we see the created world, it reveals a creator. So no one is without excuse for the evidence of God. If there's creation, there is a creator. All the evidence shows space, time, matter had a cause. So the creator must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial like a spirit. That is exactly what we mean by God. We also all have a conscience. Yes, you have a conscience. You are not a meat molecule. You're not a biological freak accident. Conscience is a soul thing, a spiritual thing, an internal knowledge of right and wrong. So if we have these moral laws internally, then there must be a moral law giver. We all have experienced in our conscience guilt. Unfortunately, some people reject that guilt, which is why they choose to reject God, because they don't want to be morally accountable. Your conscience proves your soul's existence, meaning you are created, which means you too have a creator. Everyone has those two things, creation and conscience that provides the evidence for God. What some people don't have is the name of God, and that is Jesus Christ, and that is our responsibility as Christians. Being a Christ follower means doing what Christ commanded us to do. Christ commanded believers to offer people everywhere a reasonable chance to know him. It's called the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Know God and make him known. I'm actually going to read the full verse. It's Matthew 28 verses 19 through 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we are entrusted with the task of telling others. We who have received Christ as Lord and Savior are accountable to him. In Haggai chapter 2 verse 4 it says, Be strong all you people and work, for I am with you. The Great Commission, God says the same thing. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. So go, baptize, teach. I am with you. Take courage and get to work. Each of us will have to give an account to God. That's what Romans tells us in Romans chapter 14. We Christians will not be judged by our sins because our sins are covered by his righteousness. However, we will be judged by what we've done with the things God trusted to us. 
You can actually read that in Matthew chapter 25. It's the parable of talents. Christians must finish the task Christ began. And to be honest, I think the church community is failing horribly at this. They're like the people of Haggai. We're focused on our own priorities and not God's priority. And we're masking it in spiritual ways. We go to our Bible study. We have our prayer meetings. But we're unsure if we should attend a gay wedding. Just consider consider your ways. If someone's inviting you to their wedding, they have a relationship with you. And you are an ambassador of Christ. That community probably needs to hear the gospel message. All people need to hear the gospel message. Jesus, in fact, was called a friend of sinners. And when they called them that, it wasn't considered a good title. The religious leaders were insulting him by calling him a friend of sinners, a drunkard, demon possessed. They criticized Jesus for spending time with the outcast and socially unacceptable people. But Jesus was with the people. He built bridges. He didn't burn them. Our first priority is teaching Christ as savior before people meet him as judge. But unfortunately, we're so quick to present Christ as judge. You're going to hell before we present him as Savior. The well-known Bible verse in John 3.16, if we really focus on this verse, if you hadn't heard it before, I'll go ahead and read it. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The danger is that man could perish. The hope is that he may have eternal life. We enjoy God's pardon on ourselves, yet we keep it from unreached people. Christ died a cruel death on the cross in order that there might be good news to tell. Because the bad news we already know, we're all condemned. The good news is John 3.16. People need saving. Get people to a knowledge of God. Jesus Christ as Savior. If we really took John 3.16 seriously, we would understand that we are all facing spiritual death. And I think it's more important is to share the hope of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. So guys, God bless you. Please go out and do God's work. Build his kingdom. Amen. Just wrapping up this presentation. Key truths. Chapter 1, verse 4 is your highlighted verse. The significance is putting God's things first. God will worry about the details. Just follow him. The immediate message, the message to the Israelites, is to get the temple rebuilt. The message to us, it teaches us to put God's matters first.